My thanks to Alex Bathiani, and it's a great privilege for an Irishman to be in Vienna over a Paddy's weekend. So I took it easy on the Guinness last night, so I'm in, in mint condition for this presentation. It's customary in the literature to speak of logotherapy as representing the third Viennese school of psychotherapy, following Freudian psychoanalysis and Adlerian individual psychology. However, when Dr. Viktor Frankl, the founder of our discipline, mentions logotherapy as a psychotherapy, he is employing the latter word generally and generically to refer to mental health and healing. It is doubtful Frankl would have agreed with the way the profession of psychotherapy is becoming regulated by Europe. At the moment, there are no statutory regulations governing the practice of psychotherapy in most of the European countries. A European certificate of psychotherapy is being offered to groups and individuals who fulfil certain stringent criteria laid down by the umbrella group calling itself the European Association of Psychotherapy. To train as a therapist will require 1,400 contact hours over four years duration, 250 hours of personal therapy with 800 hours of theory to include psychopathology, 150 hours of supervision and 300 to 600 hours of clinical practice with patients under regular supervision. All of which I had to fulfil when, when in a former incarnation I trained as a psychoanalyst. The term psychological therapist will replace both psychotherapist and counsellor. So the question is where does that leave us as logotherapists? It is difficult to see how logotherapy fits in with these requirements. After all, Frankel tells us that man is more than psyche, man is spirit. Moreover, Frankel felt that even reading his books could be therapeutic. Furthermore, to take a concrete example, logotherapist as eminent as Alex Bethiani, the director of the Victor Frankel Institute in Vienna, did his training with one of Dr. Frankel's foremost living disciples, Dr. Elizabeth Lucas, much lauded by Frankel himself. And in Dr. Lucas's institute, there is no requirement for formal therapy. The closest she comes to providing this is the experience of a directed autobiography, where participants relate details of their lives to a group who actively listen and comment. I conduct this in my own institute, and I can say that this approach is profoundly therapeutic, though it would not be recognised by Europe. One student of this experience of group logotherapy writes, and I quote, Recalling my past life, writing it and recounting it to you has been an invaluable exercise. It has enabled me to structure the disordered pieces of my life and give them visible shape. From it has emerged an unfinished mosaic which is peculiarly mine. It will be my vada mecum and its concreteness a source of confidence in all my future engagements. I may not know where my life is heading, but I know that it is unfolding in greater fullness. Enough, I have been given wings and a needle in the mind to respond to." End of quote. It is worthwhile to remind ourselves of the meaning of logotherapy itself, following Frankel's own words on the subject, and to see how different it is from what is now offering itself as psychotherapy. The subtitle of Viktor Frankl's first book, penned in a concentration camp, The Doctor and the Soul, is From Psychotherapy to Logotherapy implying from the very outset that there is some difference between these two disciplines. Frankel, of course, himself does speak of logotherapy in other passages as being a psychotherapy, but presumably he meant this term loosely, as understood within the cultural context of his own day. Logotherapy is a therapy which starts from man's spirit, which recognises and respects man's psychophysico-spiritual unity. So it's a therapy in spiritual terms, the aim of logotherapy initially was not to supplant, but to supplement psychotherapy. And Frankel tells us in The Will to Meaning that psychoanalysis is its indispensable foundation. However, over the years, logotherapy has developed into its own independent system, and few logotherapists are rooted in Freud and in existential philosophers such as Martin Heidegger and Max Scheller, as Frankel was. Indeed, in 1984, at the first Argentine Congress on Logotherapy, according to Omar Lazarte, people present remember Frankel saying that he supported himself on two pillars, Heidegger and Freud. Another aim of logotherapy is to purge, according to Frankel, psychotherapy of its psychologism. Frankel delineates the differences between the two thus, and I quote, Psychotherapy endeavours to bring instinctual facts to consciousness. Logotherapy, on the other hand, seeks to bring to awareness the spiritual realities. 
There is no room for this in the stated aims and objectives of the EAP. Logotherapy indeed is specifically designed to help quote and handle those suffering over the philosophical problems with which life confronts human beings. Logotherapy, unlike all of the psychotherapies nearly, with the exception of psychosynthesis, explicitly takes into account the spiritual sphere, which Frankel calls the noetic or neurological. Unity, of course, doesn't designate wholeness, which involves the integration of somatic, psychic and spiritual aspects of the person. Quote, without the spiritual as its essential ground, this wholeness cannot exist. End of quote. The spiritual self emerges from unconscious depths. Logotherapy is the clinical application of Frankel's existential analytic approach. Already in 1926, logotherapy, quote, had extended beyond the scope of psychotherapy, beyond the psyche, beyond the psychological dimension, to include the neurological dimension, or logos, end of quote. So frankly, in psychology, in its clinical practice, is both a theory, sorry, a therapy and an analysis. It is a logo, not a psychotherapy, just as it is an existential rather than a psychoanalysis. Frankly, an existential analysis differs quite radically from that of Boss and Binswanger, Caruso and May, in that it draws in its philosophical dimension more from Max Scheller's phenomenology and philosophical anthropology, as evidenced especially in logotherapy's tridimensional ontology, rather than in the Heideggerianism of the other schools of continental existential analysis. So let's be clear, logotherapy is not, I contend, a psychotherapy as presently conceived of by Europe. It is a noetic therapy, a newology rather than a psychology, and I consider it also a philosophical form of praxis. Didn't the great Eric Vogelin, the Platonic scholar par excellence, not tell us that Frankel in modern times was renewing and retrieving the older Platonic tradition of philosophy as a therapeia with his Socratic dialogue? Many commentators place logotherapy within the humanistic and integrative school, but logotherapy is not eclectic, it is existential, that is to say personalist, not humanistic, and with its explicit reference to transcendence, it may also be construed as a transpersonal theory and therapy too. Peter Sarkani's seminal article, Outlines of Victor Emile Frankel's Religious Philosophy, is instructive in this regard. He argues that logotherapy and existential analysis is rooted in the philosophical dimension and that its theory of personality is transpersonal. In another article, an outline of the philosophical care of the soul, Sarkani, who's here today, outlines the case made superbly by Pierre Hadot in his Philosophy as a Way of Life, that logotherapy be considered as a philosophical therapy, which has as its principal aim the cure of the soul. This platonic philosophical tradition of care of the self ruptures in the Middle Ages and in modernity, but is alive and well in the 20th century in the work of Wittgenstein, Jean Patoschka, Jaeger, Michel Foucault, Pierre Hadot and others. Logotherapy has much in common with this older philosophical tradition, which views philosophy not only as a noetic therapy, but as a practical system of spiritual exercises which were developed initially by the Stoics and others, and which find their way into logotherapy as de-reflection, Socratic dialogue, and attitudinal modulation. The new movement of philosophical counselling, which started in 1981 by Gerard Achenbach in Cologne, and which continues to be practised by others, such as Lou Marinoff, are heirs to this tradition. Logotherapy returns us to the therapeutic tradition of classic Greek philosophy. Care of the soul is practised primarily, though not exclusively, through Socratic dialogue. Logotherapy and existential analysis is a kind of philosophical ministry. Sarkani observes, and I quote, logotherapy can be perceived and practised as a kind of philosophical counselling, end of quote. It is Frankel who has realised with his logotherapy the ancient dreams of healing by reason and has fulfilled their therapeutic ambitions. However, logotherapy, it seems to me, goes beyond philosophical counselling 
in that Frankel has also developed and incorporated into his system a classification, a psychiatric one, of the neuroses and psychoses, as evidenced in his On the Theory and Therapy of Mental Disorders. More than anything, I suppose logotherapy is a practical philosophy, a way of living meanfully and mindfully. There is another thinker who argues similarly, and that is Reinhard Zeiser, and I'd like to draw briefly in his paper, Working on the Noetic Dimension of Man, where he asserts that we can discover the ancient spiritual exercises in contemporary logotherapy, and he makes the point that most philosophical practitioners are actually practicing logotherapy. He begins by stating that philosophical practice and logotherapy have a lot in common in that both are working on the noetic dimension of the human person. Zeiser calls Frankel a, quote, pioneer of philosophical practice. In principle, he says, the spiritual exercises by the ancient philosophers are nothing more than the methods of logotherapy. Socratic dialogue, modification of attitudes, paradoxical intention, de-reflection and the existential analysis of dreams. The question is, do we want to change logotherapy's fundamentals so much in order to join the European Association of Psychotherapy or to set up our own accrediting body with standards, a code of ethics and articles of memorandum, as I argue we should? So I propose that we govern ourselves and establish a European Association of Logotherapy an existential analysis based in Vienna that will set standards we can all agree upon, such as, for example, perhaps a two-year rather than four-year training, delivering diplomats in logotherapy that will be accredited by the Viktor Frankl Institute of Vienna. In the Viktor Frankl Institute of Ireland, I offer a two-year training. We meet once weekly for three hours of lectures. On top of this, there are weekly reflective writing assignments and readings. In year one, the focus is on logotherapy's philosophical anthropology. Students graduate with an associate in logotherapy certificate. Year two is clinical and concentrates on psychopathology. Once weekly therapy is required in year two for 50 hours. And the group carries out a directed autobiography, which takes place once a month over a nine month period. At the end, a diploma in logotherapy is awarded and I find that that approach works well uh, within the cultural context of Ireland. And I also established a, a programme called the Boomerang Effect for Teenagers in Crisis and presented it in London to a group of social workers at the invitation of Doreen Francis, who's here today, a friend and colleague and a coadjutor of my institute and director of her own London chapter with whom I'm working in close collaboration and that's been a great success so far. In conclusion, I would like to make, make some practical suggestions, kind of nine points. That an international body be set up in order to regulate ourselves. That close ties be established with Vienna. That we engage in clinical conversations, supervision if you like, with our colleagues. That we become members of the Vienna Institute. That advanced summer sessions and seminars on logotherapy be run in Vienna for practicing logotherapists that a biannual international conference be held here, that seminars and Socratic dialogue be offered, as well as accreditation and recognition, a directory of practicing logotherapists could be put together, and finally, that the collected works of Viktor Frankl be published and translated into English. In this present European financial and cultural meltdown, I believe Viktor Frankl's message of meaning now more than ever needs to be heard. The future is bright, the stakes are high, our spirits remain defiant. Thank you very much.